us that the title of our subject for this evening is En Route to a New World Order. Before we get into our study, we do want to ask for the Lord's presence. Never should we open God's Word without prayer. And so I invite you reverently to bow your heads as we ask God to be with us. Father in heaven, we ask that as we open your word this evening and as we look at some events in history and in prophecy, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to open people's minds and hearts to the truth. Many things that we've studied undoubtedly are difficult for people who have belonged to these systems that we've spoken about. I just ask, Lord, that you will give each one the willingness to open the heart and receive the truth as it is in Jesus. We thank you, Father, for the promise of your presence. We know that you will be with us because we claim the promise in the name of Jesus. Amen. We must ask as we begin our study today, what are the objectives of the Roman Catholic Church today? Now, we studied last time that the sign of the Roman Catholic Church's authority is the change in the law of God, the first day of the week, Sunday. If that's the case, then we would expect the papacy to seek and ensure the enforcement of the sign of its authority. In other words, the enforcement of Sunday as the day of rest. In fact, for the last 120 years, and I say 120 years because it's since a very famous encyclical called Rerum Novarum by Pope Leo XIII in 1891, the papacy's social theory has consistently used four specific expressions. One of those expressions is the common good. Basically, that means that individually is an individuality or individualism is something to be dreaded. Secondly, another common word that is used is the word solidarity. And basically what that means is that we are in this all together and we must unite in one ecumenical body and avoid, at all costs, sectarianism. And then there's the word subsidiarity. Subsidiarity simply means that our personal interests are subsidiary to the common good of the whole. And finally, another expression which appears very frequently in Roman Catholic social theory literature is the universal destination of goods. And basically what that means is that private property is not necessarily personal but rather belongs to all humanity and should be redistributed according to need. Now I'd like to read a statement that was made by a recent pope, Pope Benedict XVI. That's the pope before the one that is in now, before Francis I. Because this is where he expresses these uh, specific terms that we've looked at as we begun our study today. This is found in Benedict's uh, encyclical Caritas in Veritate, which means ve charity and truth, or love in truth. Paragraph 67. This is how it reads. To manage the global economy, to revive economies hit by the crisis, to avoid any deterioration of the present crisis and the greater imbalances that would result, to bring about integral and timely disarmament, food security and peace, to guarantee the protection of the environment, and to regulate migration. For all this, there is urgent need of a true world political authority, as my predecessor, Blessed John 23, indicated some years ago. Such an authority would need to be regulated by law to observe consistently the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity, to seek to establish the common good. Do you see the terms here? To seek to establish the common good and to make a commitment to securing authentic, integral human development inspired by the values of charity and truth. 
furthermore, such an authority would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Obviously, it would have to have the authority to ensure compliance with its decisions from all parties, and also with the coordinated measures adopted in various international forums. This is, a, is an unbelievable statement about the aspirations of the Roman Catholic Papacy. Now the question is, who would be responsible for the implementation of this global socialist ideal? Current events clearly indicate that it will be implemented and enforced by the political leaders of the world at the behest of the Roman Catholic Papacy. What, Be what Benedict XVI was saying is that the international community must accept and enforce the social moral theory of the papacy. I'm going to read you a couple of statements that are not in your material, but uh, they are very significant when it comes to who will be behind this world authority. Pius IX, who was Pope from 1846 to 1878, wrote the following, that the principle which Leo XIII so clearly established must be laid down at the outset here, namely, that there resides in us, that is in the papacy, the right and duty, listen carefully now, to pronounce with supreme authority upon social and economic matters. So he's saying the papacy has supreme authority to speak on social and economic matters. Even more recently, Vatican Council II, which was celebrated from 1963 to 1965, stated this in uh, one, of the, um, one of the decisions uh, that was made at the council. Moreover, since in virtue of her mission and nature, she, that is the Roman Catholic Church, is bound to no particular form of culture, nor to any political, economic, or social system, the church, by her very universality, can be a very close bond between diverse, diverse human communities and nations. Now listen carefully. Provided these trust her and truly acknowledge her right to true freedom in fulfilling her mission. Now, if you look at the history of the papacy, you would wonder whether the nations of the world could really trust the papacy. But uh, what this is saying is that the papacy can make a great contribution to the world in social and economic matters as long as the nations of the world are willing to trust the papacy. It is the papacy's objective, folks, to reestablish the union of church and state that existed during the 1260 years of papal supremacy. The ultimate papal objective is to get the civil powers of the world to enforce the sign of the papacy's authority, which we have already noticed is the observance of Sunday as the day of rest. It is no coincidence that the international community is promoting the identical causes that the Roman Catholic Church is proposing these days. Pope Francis the, the, uh, I has found three causes that resonate with the political worlds of the uh, politic, political leaders of the entire world. Number one, the need to eradicate poverty and to solve the problem of massive migration. Number two, the need to save the family, however you define the word family. And finally, the need to solve the severe problem of climate change. And Francis has linked all three of these causes of his with the need for a Sunday rest. I have not included all of the statements in, in here from Pope Francis I, but what he says is, the environment needs one day a week to rest. 
And I'll bet you you can't guess which day he says the environment should rest. Sunday. He has also say, it said that the capitalist overlords need to give the overworked poor a day of rest. I'll bet you you can't day, guess which day that is. Sunday. He has also stated that the family needs one day to attend church and to connect with its spiritual roots. I'll bet you you can't day which, guess which day that is. Sunday. There are danger signals very close to home, folks. Let me just share some of those danger signals with you in our very country. As you know, last year, towards the end of September, Pope Francis I visited the United States of America. His first visit was to the White House, where he sat down with President Obama for about 45 minutes, and the problems that they addressed were the very problems that are the talking points of this pope. Poverty, immigration, and the problem of climate change. Then the Pope addressed a joint session of the Congress of the United States of America. And once again, the talking points were family, poverty, and climate change. Next, the Pope gave a speech to inaugurate the 70th anniversary of the United Nations. And he addressed before the United Nations, even in a stronger language, these same issues. When Francis finished his presentation, he received a standing ovation from the leaders of 193 nations of the world. And this standing ovation lasted for several minutes. Then Pope Francis moved on to Philadelphia to celebrate the family. I was personally there with a crew from Secrets Unsealed. There were millions of persons there from every religion, and from every nation on earth. In fact, the Pope celebrated an outdoor mass on September 27 of last year. He also gave a speech before Constitution Hall. This is, this is the most amazing thing of all, because in Constitution Hall in Philadelphia is where the three founding documents of the United States were ratified, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. And there stood the Pope in the very place where these were ratified, an individual who does not believe in any of what we find in the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights and the Constitution, and he's speaking to a multitudinous crowd. Now, I want you to notice also that the United States and the Vatican have become closer and closer with the passing of time. Probably many of you are aware of the fact that uh, Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II cooperated in a secret alliance to overthrow what used to be the Soviet Union. It was an incredible alliance. In fact, it's described in the book His Holiness. And uh, it's a fascinating book. It's pretty large. It's, uh, uh, it's about, uh, I would say, 500 or 600 pages by Woodward and Bernstein, the Watergate guys, remember, from the Washington Post? Uh, actually, this book describes how the United States and the, and the Vatican colluded through military strength and through the intelligence of the papacy to overthrow the former Soviet Union. We also know that recently uh, the Pope uh, maneuvered so that the United States could establish diplomatic relations with the Vatican. And President Obama requested that Pope Francis help him in the process of closing the prison there at Guantanamo. There has been a very close relationship in the last two or three decades between the United States and the Roman Catholic Papacy. Now I'd like to present one example as to how the Papacy gets its foot in the door to influence the political powers of the world. We are going to use the example of climate change. You see, the political leaders of the world and the papacy have the same basic theme concerning climate change. And I believe that the papacy is really behind all of this talk about the need for 
a solution to climate change. Let's go through the different steps that the papacy has taken. In April of 2015, the, uh, uh, the Pope gave us a speech before the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. The report was published and the name of it was Climate Change and the Common Good. I read this entire document. It presents a doomsday scenario of what will happen to this planet if the issue of climate change is not resolved. Then, uh, on May 24, 2015, the Pope published his encyclical, Laudato Si, which basically this encyclical addresses the problem of climate change. I have also read this entire encyclical. It presents also a doomsday scenario if this problem is not addressed. Political leaders all over the world have lauded this encyclical. They said this is the type of thing that we need the world to know so that the world can address this severe problem. Then we move on to September 22, 2015. That's when the Pope met with President Obama. And one of the main topics that they dealt with in their conversation in the White House for about 45 minutes was the issue of climate change. And then the Pope spoke to a joint session of Congress. This was September 24, 2015. Once again, the Pope addressed before a joint session of Congress the issue of climate change. And then the Pope saved the best for last. On September 28, 2015, the Pope, as I mentioned before, gave the keynote address at the 70th session of the United Nations General Assembly in New York. The speech contained the usual papal talking points. And by the way, you can Google this. You can find the speech that he gave and you can read the entire speech. Basically, it dealt with the issue of poverty, immigration, family, and above everything else, climate change. At the end of his speech, and by the way, you can Google his speech also to see that I'm telling you the truth. At the end of his speech, when he addressed these issues, he received a thunderous standing ovation by the 193 nations represented there that lasted for several minutes. At the UN, they approved what is known as the 2030 Agenda, which has 17 goals and 169 targets. Basically, the idea is that by the year 2030, they expect to eradicate poverty and to solve the problem of climate change. And they expect every nation on earth to cooperate with these 17 global goals and 169 targets. By the way, if you read this 2030 agenda, and I've read the entire agenda also, because I'm not talking about something I read in the newspaper, I'm talking about reading the documents themselves, Basically, if this, uh, if this transpires or goes, it is going to lead to an elimination of national autonomy, a centralized global socialist system under the control of the papacy, a world economy, a wipeout of individualism, an elimination of sectarianism. It will determine the curriculum to be used in the education of children, it will promote gender equality, not in the good sense of the term, but in the sense that we all know about. It will propose a redistribution of the wealth of the world, and it will impose severe global penalties upon nations that refuse to address these problems. Is that scary? Notice what Ban Ki-moon had to say. He's the general secretary of the United Nations. He stated, the new agenda is a promise by leaders to all people everywhere. It is a universal, integrated, and transformative vision for a better world. Institutions will have to become fit for a grand new purpose. We must engage all actors. Notice that this is universal. We must engage all actors as we did in shaping the agenda. We must include parliaments and local governments 
and work with cities and rural areas. We must rally businesses and entrepreneurs. We must involve civil society in defining and implementing policies and give the space to hold us to account. We must listen to scientists and academia. We will need to embrace a data revolution. Most important, we must set to work now. That doesn't end the climate change discussion. In Paris, November 30 to December 12 of last year, 2015, 174 nations, actually 196 nations, met to approve what is known as the Paris Agreement. This Paris Agreement was that nations should sign on to the 2030 Agenda. 174 nations signed the Paris Agreement, including Secretary of State uh, John Kerry with his granddaughter on his lap, which means that the United States is also committed to this global agenda, this 2030 agenda. Francis, as we know, is the first Jesuit pope. Now, it's very interesting to notice how the Jesuits operate. You know, people in the world today, they don't, they're not afraid of the Jesuits anymore because they don't know what the Jesuits all, are all about. Let me read you this statement from Ellen White about how the Jesuits work. They don't work openly, overtly. They work in an underhanded way where it looks like they're doing good when really their objective is to gain world dominion. Notice this statement from Great Controversy, page 234 and 235. At this time, she's speaking about at the time of the Protestant Reformation, at this time the order of the Jesuits was created, the most cruel, unscrupulous, and powerful of all the champions of popery. There was no crime too great for them to commit, no deception too base for them to practice, no disguise too difficult for them to assume vowed to perpetual poverty and humility. Notice that they, that they gave the air of poverty and of humility. So it says, vowed to perpetual poverty and humility, it was their studied aim to secure wealth and power to be devoted to what? To the overthrow of Protestantism and the re-establishment of the papal supremacy. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons and hospitals. Have you heard of Francis doing that any time recently? Absolutely. Visiting prisons and hospitals, ministering to the sick and the poor, professing to have renounced the world, and buried the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. Under various disguises, the Jesuits worked, now notice what they do, worked their way into what? Ah, into the political system, into offices of state, climbing up to be the what? Counselors of kings and shaping what? The policy of nations. Is that what we're seeing? Absolutely. The Jesuits rapidly spread themselves over Europe and wherever they went, there followed a revival, a revival of popery. Are we seeing that in the United States? Yes, we are. It's because there is a Jesuit pope. And by the way, have you noticed that Pope Francis doesn't address abortion, he doesn't address gay marriage except to say, who am I to judge? Have you noticed what he addresses? Poverty, family, climate change. You say, why does he address those? Because those are the very themes that the political leaders of the world want to address. If he addressed abortion and if he, and if he spoke out against gay marriage and, and if he spoke against euthanasia, the political leaders of the world would shut him out. But he says, I must use themes where I can get my foot in the door. That is the way in which the Jesuits operate. There are many non-Adventists that have given warning about the papacy. Re, uh, a revivalist who wrote a couple of centuries ago by the name of Philip J. Spenner had these words to say, I am convinced that Roman Babylon, that's the papacy, 
will again regain all of its previous power before the last judgment overtakes it. I fear that most of the nations, intimidated by its power and terrified by its brutality, will allow the yoke shaken off some 200 years ago to be laying on them again. Are we seeing that today? Except that the leaders don't see the yoke right now, but they will see it later. Evangelical researcher Dave Hunt, with whom I disagree profusely on most of his futurist ideas, had something very true to say about the papacy. Notice in his book Global Peace, page 116. Why do the world leaders want to get into bed with the Vatican? Notice the idea of fornication or adultery between the papacy and the kings. Notice this. The heads of state in today's world all recognize that the pope wields a power which in many ways is even greater than their own. It is not only Catholicism, 900 million subjects and enormous wealth that causes the world's most powerful governments to cultivate friendly relations with the Roman Catholic Church. It is because Vatican City's citizens are found in great members, numbers in nearly every country. They constitute an international network that reaches into the inside circles of the world's power centers. What is Dave Hunt saying? People recognize, the leaders of the nations of the world recognize that the papacy wields a power that is even greater than theirs. And the papacy is involved in the inner circle of the decisions that are made by the nations of the world. John W. Robbins, a reformed scholar, wrote a book called Ecclesiastical Megalomania, page 187. If you really want to read a good book, this is a fantastic book. He stated this, what the Roman Catholic Church state accomplished on a small scale during the Middle Ages is what it desires to achieve on a global scale in the coming millennium. He wrote this at the end of the 20th century. He also quoted Ayn Rand, who was a novelist and philosopher back in the 60s, very well known. Uh, this is how he quotes what Ayn Rand said. It almost sounds like an Adventist. The Catholic Church has never given up the hope to reestablish, if she has to reestablish it, she must have had it at some time, right? To reestablish the medieval union of church and state with a global state and a global theocracy as its ultimate goal. The Roman church state is a hybrid, a monster of ecclesiastical and political power. Its political thought is totalitarian. In other words, it admits no rivals. And whenever it has had the opportunity to apply its principles, the result has been bloody repression. If during the last 30 years, it has softened its assertions of full, supreme, and irresponsible power, and has murdered fewer people than before. Such changes in behavior are not due to a change in its ideas, but to a change in its circumstances. What is the change in the circumstances? It is in captivity. It has a wound. He continues quoting, the Roman church state in the 20th century, and believe, he doesn't believe in Re Revelation 13 the way we do, but notice the language he uses. The Roman church state in the 20th century, however, is an institution recovering from a mortal wound. If and when, I would eliminate the if part, but she said, if and when it regains, so it must have lost it, right? It regains its full power and authority, it will impose a regime more sinister than any the planet has yet seen. If Adventists don't cry out, the stones will cry out. The non-Adventists can see it. Now, we've studied the great prophetic chain. Let's review it. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, the divided Roman Empire, Papal Rome ruled for 1260 years. Papal Rome received a deadly wound in 1798. At the same time, the beast from the earth rose, representing the United States of America. And we are here. 
We are during the period of respite from persecution. In other words, the papacy is still bound and the papacy is still wounded. It has not totally recovered its power yet. There has been an era of cessation of persecution for over 200 years. What is the next event in the drama? We can see it transpiring as I speak. It will be when the beast from the earth works to restore the power to the beast that received the deadly wound and was sent into captivity. Do you remember that the beast from the earth, everything it does is to please the first beast? It commands everyone to worship the first beast. It exercises the authority of the first beast. It does everything on behalf of the first beast. It makes an image of the first beast. It enforces the mark of the first beast. In other words, the United States, believe it or not, and we can see it by what happened in September of last year and what's happening as we speak today. The United States of America is going to become an ally of the papacy and is going to help restore the power that the papacy lost. Now let me read you a very interesting statement. This is from Malachi Martin, a Roman Catholic Jesuit who wrote the famous book, The Keys of This Blood. And I want you to notice he's commenting on the deadly wound and the reason why the papacy is not able to carry it forward its agenda today. He doesn't realize that he's commenting on Revelation chapter 13, but we do. Notice this statement. For 1,500 years and more, papal Rome had kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the wide world. By and large, and admitting some exceptions, that had been the Roman view. What had been the Roman view? Keeping a strong, as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the wide world. That is the Roman view. So he said that had been the Roman view until, listen carefully, 200 years of what? Would that be like the imprisonment of the papacy? Yes, 200 years of inactivity had been what? Why is she inactive? Had been imposed upon the papacy by the major secular powers of the world. Why is the papacy inactive according to Malachi Martin the Jesuit? Because it had been imposed on her by the major secular powers of the world because they don't allow her to use them anymore. Three main points in this quotation. Number one, the papacy kept as strong a hand as possible in each local community around the wide world for 1,500 years. Number two, during the last 200 years, the papacy has been unable to exert its power around the world because it has been inactive. Number three, the reason the papacy has been inactive for 200 years is because the great secular powers of the world have imposed it upon her. It's obvious that Martin does not realize that he is describing the deadly wound and the captivity of the papacy that is described in Revelation 13 and verse 10. What happened 200 years before 1986? He wrote this in 1986. So if he says for 200 years the papacy has been inactive because the secular powers of the world do not allow it uh, to, to use them, we would have to go 200 years back to see what was the event that led it into, into captivity. What is it that happened about 200 years before 1986? You go back to 1786 and you are in the midst of the French Revolution. When the papacy received its deadly wound and Pope Pius VI was dethroned from his, uh, from his seat and he was taken captive to France where he died in exile. And by the way, France established a republic. They said this is going to be a representative style of government. This is not going to be run by the papacy anymore. But listen, the French Revolution did more than just give a deadly wound to the papacy. The French also provided an example for many other nations in Europe to follow her example. In other words, one by one, the nations of Europe forsook the papacy after France forsook the papacy. Let me read you a statement from Cardinal Manning in his book that he wrote in 1862, uh, The Temporal Power of the Vicar of Jesus Christ. This is pages 140 and 141. 
He's writing in 1862, and he's lamenting the fact that the nations of Europe have forsaken the papacy. They no longer support the papacy. Notice what the st statement says. See this Catholic Church, this Church of God, feeble and weak. <laughs> what does feeble and weak mean? <laughs> Wounded, right? Feeble and weak. Rejected even by the very nations called Catholic. There is Catholic France and Catholic Germany and Catholic Italy giving up this exploded figment of temporal power of the vicar of Jesus Christ. In other words, they've given up the idea that the vicar of Christ should have any temporal power or should have any civil power. And so, because the church seems what? Seems weak. And the vicar of the Son of God is renewing the passion of his master upon earth. Therefore, we are scandalized. Therefore, we turn our faces from him. So notice he's saying not only France, but what? Germany, Italy, and other nations in Europe turned their backs on the papacy. They said, we're not going to allow you to use us anymore. That rendered the papacy inactive. It put the papacy in captivity and kept the deadly wound in place. But prophecy tells us that the papacy's wound will heal. And she will be released from captivity. Once again, she will be able to use the civil powers of the world to accomplish her purposes. You find a description of this in, of this in Revelation chapter 17. There you see a harlot woman. What does a harlot woman represent? A woman represents a church. A harlot woman would represent a what? An apostate church. This apostate church is called Babylon. This apostate church sits on many waters. What are the many waters? Multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. This harlot has adulterous relationships with the kings of the earth. In other words, she's involved once again with the civil powers of the world. She is clothed in purple and scarlet. Have you seen the predominant colors in Roman Catholicism? Purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones. The kings of the earth gladly give her, her uh, give, uh, she gives to the kings of the earth her fermented wine, which represents false doctrine. She gives decrees that people are supposed to drink that wine. She has daughters that do her bidding, which would be the same as the beast from the earth. And most significantly, she sheds the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. That is the picture of what is going to take place in the future when the papacy recovers its worldwide dominion. I want you to notice now in this statement by Ellen White the similarity between what she says and what we read from Malachi Martin. Only Ellen White is not predicting what happened, but she is predicting what will happen. Notice this statement in Great Controversy, page 564. She understood this idea of captivity and wound very, very clearly. She stated, let the restraints, what is a restraint? Is the papacy restrained now? Yes. And we're going to see in a minute what the restraints are. Let the restraints now imposed by what? So why is the papacy restrained or why is the papacy in captivity? She's saying it's because of the what? They are imposed by the secular governments. But she says, let those be what? Removed. Would she be let out of her captivity if, if, if the restraints are removed? Yes. She says, let the restraints now imposed by secular governments be removed and Rome be what? Reinstated. So she must have been there before. Rome be reinstated in her former power, and what? And there would speedily be a revival of her tyranny and persecution. Are you understanding that statement? Is it very similar to Malachi Martin? Very, very similar. He says, inactivity has been imposed on the papacy by the major secular powers of the world 200 years ago, French Revolution, and then all the nations in Europe followed suit. Ellen White says, let those restraints imposed by those civil governments be removed and the papacy will once recover her power 
and do what she did in the past. Are you understanding this? We've discussed this before, but we never read these specific statements. Now, without intending to be disrespectful to any sincere individuals within the Roman Catholic Church, I would like to say that the papacy is like a parasite or a leech. The dictionary defines a parasite in the following way. An animal or plant that lives in or on another animal or plant and gets food or protection from it. A person or thing that takes something from someone or something else and does not do anything to earn it or to deserve it. Is that a good description of the papacy? Yes. Here's the definition of a leech. A person who clings to another for personal gain, especially without giving anything in return, and usually with the implication or effect of exhausting the other's resources. That is a good description of the papacy. You see, when the papacy cannot attach itself to the civil powers of the world, it is weak, it is wounded. But when the papacy is able to attach itself to the political leaders of the world, it gets its strength again from, from those powers, and it is now free, but it is not free and powerful in itself. It is through the power uh, of that entity to which the papacy attached itself. Are you following me or not? Ironically, it will be the beast with lamb-like horns, the United States of America, who will be foremost in helping the first beast recover its power, but we are told that every nation in the world will follow the example of the United States. Isn't that interesting that many nations in the world follow the example of the United States in establishing governments without a pope and without a king? And later on in its history, the nations of the world will follow the example of the United States in joining church and state and allowing the papacy to recover its power. Notice this statement from volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 18. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, that's the sign of the beast which we already studied, Sunday, the sign of its authority, she says, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. Let me ask you, how far along are we in the prophetic chain? We are almost at the end of the prophetic chain. The prophetic chain that we're going to study in the next two lectures is that there will be a final denunciation of this power, calling God's people to come out of this system before God's wrath falls upon this system. Then God's people will go through a time of trouble such as never has been seen, and they will be delivered by Jesus Christ, according to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. We will speak about the time of trouble and that glorious deliverance in our last two studies together. On Independence Day of 1899, Ellen White wrote the following about the United States. I wonder what she would write today. The greatest and most favored nation upon the earth is the United States. A gracious providence has shielded this country and poured upon her the choicest of heaven's blessings. Here the persecuted and oppressed have found refuge. Here the Christian faith in its purity has been taught. This people have been the recipients of great light and unrivaled mercies. But these gifts have been repaid by ingratitude and forgetfulness of God. The infinite one keeps a reckoning with the nations, and their guilt is proportioned to the light rejected. A fearful record now stands in the register of heaven against our land, but the crime which shall fill up the measure of her iniquity is that of making void the law of God. In other words, by imposing a day of worship which is a counterfeit established by the beast, taking the seal out of the law of God and placing the seal of a man in its place. So the question is, who is going to warn the world not to worship the beast 
and not to receive the mark of the authority of the beast. Certainly not the Protestants. They have already capitulated to the papacy. Self-proclaimed Bible-believing Protestants are looking to the Middle East for the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They don't expect, they're expecting a blasphemous individual to rise and sit in a rebuilt Jewish temple for three and a half liter, year, literal years after the rapture of the church. And Protestants are on the same page as the papacy with regards to the day of worship. By keeping Sunday, they are, without wanting to admit it, accepting the authority and the sign of the power of the Roman Catholic Church. Protestants used to have it right. Let me read you this statement from Scottish church historian and Presbyterian pastor James A. Wiley. He described what the Antichrist is like, and of course he believed that the Antichrist was the papacy. He said, It is clear that Antichrist, as depicted by our Lord and by his apostle John, is to wear a mask and to profess one thing and act another. He is to enter where? Not a rebuilt Jewish temple. He is to enter the church as Judas entered the garden, professedly to kiss his master, but in reality to betray him. He is to come with words of peace in his mouth, but war in his heart. He is to be a counterfeit Christ, Christ's likeness stamped on base metal. He is to be an imitation of Christ, a close, clever, and astute imitation, which will deceive the world for ages. Those only accepted who, taught by the Holy Spirit, shall be able to see through the disguise and detect the enemy under the mask of a friend. It's public knowledge that Pope Francis has made an overt effort to unite all Christians. Protestants have gravitated towards the papacy. As is well known, great Protestant leaders, television evangelists, such as Billy Graham, Tony Palmer, Kenneth Copeland, James Robeson, Joel Osteen, Rick Warren, representatives from the Reformed Church, the, even the Waldensians, they have expressed great admiration for the papacy. And many of them have made trips to the Vatican to visit the Pope at his invitation. I don't know if you're aware, but on July 16 of this year, you're going to have a gathering, they say, of about a million Christians from every denomination in Washington, D.C. It's called Reset uh, 2016. And I've heard that uh, the Pope is going to address this uh, union of Christians, and they say our only agenda will be Jesus. The Pope by Skype is going to address this group of a million Christians and encourage them all to unite re, re, irrespective of all of their theological differences. In fact, the Pope already, I got it today, the Pope gave a message on YouTube to all of the Protestant young people encouraging them to attend this uh, convention that is going to take place at the mall in Washington, D.C. You see, folks, folks, Protestants have lost all fear of the papacy. Why have they lost fear of the papacy, and why are they rending the papacy homage? It's because they have cast away the biblical method of interpreting prophecy. Do you think that if they followed the chain of prophecy, and they saw that the little horn, or the beast, or the harlot was the Roman Catholic system, that they would want anything to do with this system? Absolutely not. But because they've thrown away the biblical method of the chain of prophecy, they look to the Middle East, and meanwhile, the powers that are going to play a role in end-time prophecy grow in Rome and in the United States, and they can't see it because they are looking in the wrong place. Why do we exist as Seventh-day Adventists? Ellen White explained it eloquently in Volume 9 of the Testimonies, page 19. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen. That's a defensive position to defend the truth. And light bearers, that in other words is to proclaim the truth. 
to them, that is to Seventh-day Adventists, has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's messages. And then she says this, our role and our function is to proclaim the three angels' messages. She states, there is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Why do we exist as a church? To proclaim the three angels' message. And by the way, that includes denouncing the beast, his image, and his mark. Because if we don't preach that, which is one of the three angels' messages, and we don't say, worship the Creator and keep His holy Sabbath, God is going to hold us accountable for the loss of many, many people in this world. We exist to proclaim the three angels' message to the world. Now, we need to bring this to a close. It was on Thursday evening of Passion Week, and Jesus was about to agonize in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross. In preparation for His ordeal, Jesus raised a magnificent prayer to His Father. He didn't even ask for strength for Himself. His concern was with His disciples remaining, remaining firm in the midst of opposition. Right in the middle of His prayer, He pronounced the words that we find in John 17 and verse 14. I have given them your word. Here He's speaking to His Father. And the world has what? Hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Why was the world going to hate the followers of Jesus? Because He gave them His word, and they were not of the world. Here is the central reason why God's faithful people have been hated by both religious and secular in the course of world history. It is because they have God's word, and they are not of the world. In fact, earlier in John, John 15, verse 19, Jesus had already said this, speaking about His disciples, or to His disciples, if you were of the world, the world would what? Love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world what? Hates you. So if you are of the world, the world will love you. If you are not of the world, the world will what? The world will hate you. Now why do I bring this to view? I want to tell you an interesting story. In the decade of the 1950s, Protestants in the United States were extremely suspicious of the Roman Catholic papacy and strongly disliked the papacy. This was in the 50s. It was in this context when the papacy was extremely disliked in the United States and feared in the United States that a man by the name of Fulton Sheen, an archbishop of the Roman Catholic Church, decided to begin a television and radio ministry in favor of the Roman Catholic Church. He was a pioneer in this area. One day he came on the air by radio and he spoke the following words. And I must ask you, do you think that he would say the same thing today? I doubt it. Notice what he said. If I were not a Catholic and were looking for the true church in the world today, I would look for the one church which did not get along well with the world. See, the Catholic church didn't get along with Protestants. So he says, I would look for the church that the world doesn't like. He continues writing. Or, or saying, in other words, I would look for the church which the world hated. My reason for doing this would be that if Christ is, is in any one of the churches of the world today, He must still be hated as He was when He was on earth in the flesh. If you would find Christ today, then find the church that does not get along with the world. Look for the church that is hated by the world as Christ was hated by the world. Do you think Fulton Sheen would give the same speech today? <laughs> I'd rather doubt it very much because the Roman Catholic Church today is what? It is loved by the world. So he would have to change his tune. 
Now the good news is, folks, that at the very end of time, the kings of the earth that did the bidding of the papacy are going to turn against her. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 16 says, These will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. In other words, what has happened before many times in history will happen again. You remember the days of Esther? Uh, Haman prepared this plot to destroy the Jews and he deceived the king. What happened with Haman? When the king discovered that he had been deceived, was he pretty angry? What did he do? He finished off those who prepared the plot, the religious advisor. Let me ask you, who died when the three young men were thrown into the fiery furnace? Those that threw them in. Let me ask you, in Daniel chapter 6, did the advisors of the king deceive him into thinking that Daniel was a menace? Did they prepare a plot to get rid of Daniel? They most certainly did. What happened when the king discovered that he had been deceived? He turned against those who prepared the plot. So the kings of the earth today, they might think that it's a wonderful thing to cooperate with the papacy. But in the long run, one day they will wake up, but it will be too late. And they will turn against this system they committed fornication with. The kings of the earth today need to listen to the experience of Pilate. You know, when Pilate was deliberating whether to, give, uh, whether to turn Jesus over to the Jews, he received a message from his wife, and his wife said, don't have anything to do with this just man. Now Pilate had to make a decision. Would he do what the apostate Jewish church told him to do and kill Jesus, or would he listen to the voice of his wife and say, I'm not going to give in to the pressure of the apostate church. I'm going to do what is right. Sadly, Pontius Pilate chose to listen to the voice of the apostate church. And according to history, Pontius Pilate eventually committed suicide. The apostate church that prepared the plot to destroy Christ, later on the Romans came and destroyed them. History will be repeated once again. So my appeal is not only to the people of the world, but the kings of the world. Open your eyes. Do not give in to this system. Do not propose religious legislation because the end result will be terrible and your awakening will come when it is too late. <music>